Good evening, Mattatuck. Welcome to the Board of Education regular monthly meeting, Thursday, August 27th, 2020. Continue? Okay. May I have a, a motion and a second to open the meeting? I make a motion to open the meeting. I'll second that. Thank you. Thank you. And we've said the Pledge of Allegiance, so we'll move on. First on the agenda is the approval of minutes July 7th, 2020, the reorg meeting, July 7th, 2020, regular meeting, July 21st, 2020, executive session, and August 12th, 2020, executive session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motions carried. Now on to a motion to approve the claims report of July 2020 and financial and treasurer's reports. I have a motion and a second. I make a motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motions carried. Information items? Okay, so um, at this point, we're going to talk a little bit about the reopening plans and any updates, and I'm just going to combine this with the um, superintendent's report. Um, so at this time, um, I just want to thank uh, the parents that are joining our virtual parent meeting, our virtual parent meeting, sharing our continuity of learning plan. Um, we also had uh, several teacher meetings where many teachers were able to join us for conversations and at both meetings, parents were able, parents and teachers were able to ask questions, and also hear from the principals and myself um, about some of the key points within the opening plan. Uh, we prepared a PowerPoint presentation that was shared throughout that um, those presentations that is up on the website. I want to um, just direct the parents and the community to the front page of the website. Um, that is where all the key components of our continuity of learning plan will be. Um, any updates to that plan um, as they are put up will be dated at the bottom of each section of the documents. Um, letters to the community are also posted on the website. Um, documents are translatable and um, pushed out most often times through for the parents um, through our e-blasts. Um, so we will try to keep that website as up to date as possible. Um, but again, I just want to thank the community for joining us in on the conversations. I think pretty much in most of the calls, we had about 200 people uh, on the calls. Um, so um, very good response. Um, at this time, um, we uh, have had to, since our July posting of our continuity of learning plan, we've had to make some adjustments along the way. Um, new guidance has been coming out periodically throughout um, really the month of July and August. Um, our administrative team, uh, I don't think they've come up for air yet in terms of trying to keep up with reading the guidance and, you know, following all the directives within those guidance documents. Um, we've, re you know, been able to accomplish many things <laughs> um, in the past two months, but new challenges have come our way um, in putting some of those plans into action. Um, as well, um, we've had some new entrants. So at this point in time, we have, I want to say today, it's probably 49, um, but we have about 49 new entrants, but we've also had 27 students leave the district. Um, so that's, in totality, that's more entrants than last year, um, but at the same time, we had more students, I believe, leave the district than we did last year. Um, oftentimes, though, we do see new students um, uh, students leave, you know, they just, their parents don't notify us and then we get information from the receiving school. So we still have to monitor that component of it. Um, we have um, our plan going forward is for the first two weeks of school, we will be on a hybrid model. That's an every other day model. Um, we're calling it a blue gold. If you've been on the blue or gold team, a little bit student friendly. Um, so our teachers are, will be coming back on, on the second and third in preparing for those hybrid days. Um, we'll go through some of the safety trainings and just getting the teachers reacquainted with our schools and some of the safety protocols and, again, their classrooms. Um, 
We've had um, some parents request uh, some remote options at this point in time. Um, we are not able to accommodate that right now, but we are asking that any families who uh, would be interested in a remote option contact our registrar, Jenna Colasione at Cacho East, um, to just put their name on the list, and then we'll be able to gauge who's seriously interested in, in um, a remote possibility. Um, we've had some parents um, who've, whose children have had some special uh, medical uh, needs and therefore asking for some accommodations. Again, um, we ask that you reach out to us. Mrs. Allegro is handing, handling any of the medical accommodations. Um, there's certain paperwork and things that need to be filled out, doctor's notes that need to be received. And then that information is shared with our district doctor for approval and or conversations with the child's pediatrician. Um, at that at this point in time students with some medical accommodations we're trying to work with some of our teachers who have some um, special accommodations where we can pair up those students and or staff members um, we are still working through those pieces and again there's certain um, components of even the staff accommodations that we need to go through and make sure uh, we're meeting everybody's needs um, we've spent a lot of time looking at our classrooms and our buildings and particularly the classroom sizes. Um, we've had to uh, readjust many times, even though we maybe had a plan in place, we've had to make some adjustments based on new class numbers or either more or less. Um, Mr. Petretti, I'm going to ask Mr. Petretti and Dr. Devine to go through some of their reopening and some of the things they're working through, but um, we've spent some time having to move students and door classrooms, so our schools aren't going to look exactly the same um, as they did before. So, for example, you know, maybe all the kindergartners aren't in, ex in the exact location. They had to go to another part of the building to accommodate a different class or setup. Um, we've been rereading um, the, the reopening guidance uh, many times, um, and one of the things, um, as the parents and community knows, I had to send out a letter based on new guidance that came about uh, about edge-to-edge -edge, um, desk information from the New York State Education Department, um, and in consultation with our attorneys, um, it was recommended that we follow that guidance. So we had to flip back to a full hybrid model from our full reopening plan. We are back into um, a full reopening after the second week on hybrid. Um, so that letter was communicated with parents. Um, but fortunately, during that time, uh, we were, as soon as we received the guidance, we were looking at other options. And one of the other options was to purchase desk barriers. It's a three-sided poly um, uh, bicarbonate. Uh, it's really a shield that sits on all three sides of the child's desk. Um, they come in different heights appropriate for elementary students to, to high school students. We actually had ordered some of them on the onset, like as soon as that came out, to really take a look at that. There might be some one-to-one -one situations where a child may need to be closer to a teacher or in a um, speech setting uh, where that might have been more appropriate. So we had already previously ordered some of those. Um, but in this case, um, in order to reopen at the elementary level, we were able to secure um, enough desk barriers for every elementary child K through six. Um, it wasn't possible for us to order it for seven and eight because those students change classes and we wouldn't be able to wipe down in between each class for that child. There'd be a lot of spraying and wiping and waiting and backing up. So initially it was just really K through six. Um, fortunately, um, with some advocacy advocacy to Regent Tillis through the Superintendents Association, myself and some of the Nassau County superintendents, um, we were able to reach out to Regent Tillis who was able to speak to the commissioner about the conflict and guidance from New York State Ed and the Department of Health. And new guidance came out um, this week. So we were pleased to hear that uh, we can follow the six foot um, person to person, so it's considered center of child to the center of another child distance. Um, so that clarification um, was very specific. Um, in the past, superintendents had been asking about guidance. Is it the center of the child? Is it the shoulder to shoulder? Um, is it the center of the desk? Is it the center of the chair? So there was lots of questions. Um, and it's the center 
of the child to the center of the child at this point in time, but we were able to secure the desk barrier. So that gives us the flexibility of new incoming entrants as well. Um, we sent out some surveys with regard to transportation and just asking how many parents would be driving their children to school and asked they respond to that. So we could plan accordingly to plan for smaller routes. Um, that is still a work in progress at this point in time. Um, so we are looking at those responses and just ask that if parents did sign up and say they could drive their child, if they're making any changes to that, to let us know. Um, we are aiming for approximately 22 students on the bus. However, if all students are wearing masks, you do not have to um, just adhere to the 22. Um, in fact, many districts who were planning for the 22 on the bus are having to loosen up on that. Um, first of all, there's not enough buses to run the routes in some instances. And furthermore, with expected state aid cuts, uh, districts are looking at, um, you know, they're not going to be able to afford the transportation. So in making a small route. So right now we're taking a look at our transportation routes, but still trying to aim for the 22 on the bus. But again, it's not a finalized document at this point in time. Um, Mr. Baki, our um, business and operations uh, business official has been working very closely um, with the transportation department as well as our food service, really trying to get our food service um, up in line and we're asking parents if possible to provide a bag lunch just to limit um, you know some of the transition because those lunches will either be delivered to the classroom at the elementary level and or um, students will have them brought to special locations within the high school. Um, we are asking parents to really use um, the point of sale, um, Frank I'm losing my mind, uh, what's yeah, the school bucks. school bucks to sign up for school bucks so there's less um cash being used within the within the school um but there'll be a system in place where the child places their order early in the morning but there'll be a limited menu at least initially so um, we're also working with our child care provider champions to really look at the services provided to families so we will still be offering champions in the morning and in the afternoon um, they have the same, pretty much the same social distancing and cleaning protocols that we do, um, but they will be housed at Cacho East. Um, our teachers will still be engaged in professional development this year, particular attention to some technology, um, use of technology, um, but also supports for students with um, disabilities and also just to really, you know, um, look at for signs of students um, who are struggling a little bit with the return to school um, and really taking a look at the SEL piece. Um, we have a superintendent's conference day, as I said, planned for September 2nd and 3rd, where some of these pieces will be addressed, health and safety protocols, but again, looking at signs of illness and also just self-care for our employees. Um, so, you know, although schools are gonna open, it's gonna look a little bit different and we are eager and excited to welcome students back. Um, particularly with um, the goal of a safe environment in place. And um, I just want to thank the administrators for really digging in and putting in the effort to ensure the safety of the reopening plan. And also just really the CSEA and the Teachers Association for being just such amazing partners in the process. Um, both union leaders have been in great in constant conversation with myself and our administrators, and I really couldn't ask for a more supportive team and um, cooperative team. I mean, everyone has the same goal, that our kids come back to school in a safe and healthy manner, as well as our staff. Um, but I'm going to ask um, Mr. Petretti if you want to say anything um, with regard to the opening at high school, and then Dr. DeMond, if there's something that you'd like to share as well. Uh, um, again, I went over a lot of the plan with families um, on the telecast uh, two weeks ago um, really you know first and foremost is is asking for their their patience and understanding as we do reopen schools um, with the focus on doing so safely um, and uh, effectively uh, for our students there are going to be some changes things are certainly going to look a little different um, 
but we, we'll, you know, we're going to be working through all those things and uh, trying to get Matatuk back to as normal as we can um, as, as time goes on. Uh, you know, the, one of the first things parents are going to notice is, is probably an increase in drop-offs in the morning. So we are asking for, for their understanding and patience. With that, we will be doing temperature checks as children um, come out of their cars for drop-off and as students are exiting the bus before entering the buildings. Um, some of the other changes that students are going to notice is that they will immediately be going to their first period classes. Um, we used to have holding areas in different parts of the building um, prior to the start of first period. That will no longer be the case at the start of this year as uh, students will report directly to their first period classes. Students will also notice that um, hallways will have designated directions um, in which students will walk as will some of our more time to get to classes as they follow some of the the new uh, layouts and, and um, traffic direction in and about the building. Uh, students will not have access to their lockers, so that will be a change for them as well. Um, and they'll notice things like some of their classes may be in some non-traditional teaching spaces, such as the wrestling room, gymnasium, uh, band and chorus room, as we're utilizing all spaces within the building to uh, safely provide our, our children with instruction. And I want to ensure all of our students that as soon as we get in, again, I ask them to be patient with me as we uh, enter the building and then return to school in a safe manner. Uh, I know some of the traditions and activities and things that we do are very, very important to them. And uh, some of those happen right in the beginning of the year. And I am very much aware of that. And once I am committed to getting those things done and, and providing all of our students with the experiences that they've been looking forward to, um, I just ask for their patience and understanding, but we will get there. Um, I am excited, a little nervous, but definitely excited for the start of school. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody uh, in two weeks. Okay, this is Dr. Devine. Um, a couple of the procedures that uh, parents will see that are a little bit different also is our dismissal and uh, arrival procedures. Um, we're also looking for parents to um, drop off their children uh, so there are more seats available on the bus. Um, that is all going to be explained to the parents in my welcome letter that will be going home with their placement packets. So a lot of those procedures will be in there. They were also explained when we had the webinars last week to the teachers and the parents. Um, so those are all in there. Uh, children will be having lunch in their classrooms. It will be dropped off to them. They will place their order in the morning and lunch will be dropped off to them, be eating in, the, uh, in their classroom. Uh, recess will obviously be outside the best we can. We're gonna be going out as much weather as we can. Um, we're also looking for teachers to possibly bring children outside, um, socially distant to have classes outside if possible. We have a large area um, out back at Kachogi, so that's to our advantage, and we're going to use that the best we can. Um, also, having to move some teachers around in different classrooms, uh, using the space adequately. So again, we're trying to keep our grade levels together. They may be in a different part of the building, um, but they we are trying to keep them together. Um, as a cohesive unit. Um, again, we're going to have those two weeks of hybrid to test out our new procedures, but I'm confident that if we need to change anything, we will do so along with the co cooperation of the families and the teachers. So looking forward to seeing everyone for the first day of school. Um, we've been working hard to get you back, so look forward to seeing you. Um, I have a question for um, Dr. Devine, would I be able to ask it now? Um, just, I've been receiving numerous um, concerns from parents regarding the new class sizes at Kachuk East. Would you be able to tell us the class sizes sure. under the uh, new? Sure. In the, in the primary, uh, we're ranging from 15 to 18 at this time. So that's K12. Um, third is. 20. Um, fourth is 17, 18. Fifth currently is 23, 24. And sixth is 21, 22. Yeah, so while now, uh, we, we, have, we have moved um, 
sixth grade, which is 21, 22, to the kindergarten hallway. Those are the larger class sizes that could accommodate them. Uh, so they are not upstairs. Them. And since kindergarten is now smaller, they do not need those large classrooms. The kindergarten is moved to another wing. Right. And this is different from the original five day instruction plan. Um, can you tell us why? How is it different? Um, in the original plan, the classes were going to be around 15 and they were going to be smaller classes. So some of the classes are still around 15, but now we're seeing numbers of 18, 20, and 23. Was it in the continuity of learning plan? It was in the two letters that um, came from the superintendent in July and in August. And this was before the hybrid change. Yeah, Kathy, I'll speak to that. So in, um, in the July letter, you know, it explained to parents that we were looking at, you know, small class sizes, you know, some of the things that were going on, making learning changes and accommodation. Um, some of our um, classrooms really can only accommodate 15, and that's why, like as Dr. Devon just explained, the kindergarten's going to those wings. Um, but there's never been like a set, you know, it's going to be 15, it's going to be this. Um, we were really looking to how to look at each individual classroom space, and they can make determinations based on that. Um, and on the I think it's my August letter, I did mention, you know, we're shooting for class sizes around 15. Um, particularly for those classrooms that can accommodate that. Um, we weren't able to that, especially with the influx of um, enrollment. And also looking at even some of the classrooms that just, um, you know, even some of the classrooms that can accommodate 18 or 17, we really wanted to be more flexible in terms of the setup of that one. Um, we looked at a new a number of different guidance documents in terms of how you can do that. You know, there's ways to look at it in a circle in our child or in a square. And uh, we find most less barriers and lack of flexibility to accommodate more kids and then also anticipate children coming in and door. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, when we're a small class size, we have accomplished. Um, I don't think. 21 or 15 or 16 or 17 are large class sizes. Um, for the class, which is our fifth grade class, we're 23, we're 23 this morning, uh, but we're even more this afternoon. Um, we are going to be hiring another teacher um, and to break that class size up. So I don't have the math in front of me, but I think it comes out to about 18 um, if, when we break that class up. So, um, we will be able to accommodate moving, you know, another classroom to the space with 18. Um, you know, the security studies can be in the wrestling room, things like that. So we will be using our music room, the natural yeast, and the library as well as the classroom. Um, so that will be able to afford us of even some greater flexibility if one of those 18 becomes 19 or the 20 becomes 21. Um, at some point in time, you may know, have to make the call. And we're at that point where I really have to make the call of breaking that plan. So right now, we're going to break that one fit right there. Um, but I'm comfortable with the class sizes. I'm comfortable with the desk barriers that we ordered to provide an extra set of safety um, precautions in place, students with masks. And also, um, I think what's really important is, you know, when children have masks on all day, the dress bearings, you want to let those kids be able to take those masks off and just leave a little bit in their own space rather than going to a location in the room to take that mask break or going into the bathroom. Or, so I think for our elementary kids, are, you know, and maybe it's a blessing in disguise that we had to, you know, kind of change gears a little bit. Um, um, you know, of course, I recognize that parents had to really, you know, change um, and get ready for an, a different set of options. And, you know, that was very disruptive. At the same time, when I receive guidance that's more restrictive, I really think it's important that we protect the health and safety and students and staff come first here. And, you know, we can put all these things in place. But again, if I know of guidance that's out there, I'm going to follow the more restrictive guidance um, if it protects our kids and staff. Jill, can you explain a little bit more with these barriers? What's the distance that we're still looking for? We're not shortening that distance a tremendous amount because we have these barriers, or are we trying to still fit as, as wide? So we, as we have about, I want to say about, about 
<coughs> I'm hearing a little thunder <laughs> hearing that in the microphone. So um, it's about five to six feet right now. Um, in some cases, we might, you know, some kids might be a little bit further apart than that. Um, one of the things that, that uh, uh, and again, you know, we can set up the room ourselves right now, but when the teacher comes in and wants to move that child from the back corner a little bit to get them a better angle of the smart board, you know, that distance may change a little bit. So I don't want to go out there, George, and say, oh, it's exactly this. Uh, you know, uh, it, we're shooting for around five feet to six feet. Um, but I can't say that somebody might be four feet for a particular reason because it's a better environment for that child to learn in. Maybe the desk was too close to the bathroom. <laughs> it was a particular, you know, you know, there might be different reasons why you want to move those kids. Um, so, but around five to six. Um, just one last question, one just or what, uh, one last thought. Uh, it's just my concern is that under this new plan, even though we have the barriers, we're putting more students in a classroom than the original plan, which increases the risk of infection because they're all breathing the same air. Um, and under the and we're still getting new entrants, so we could start with 18 or 20. But if we get more students, we're going to be in the 20s now. And and I don't know how high we're going to go. Um, and I feel that students need to be in a safer environment. And that environment is in the original plan to stick around 15. So you keep saying the original plan, so there was no number said in the original plan. I, I know you've mentioned that before, but I, I've gone through the original plan that was submitted and it did not have that number of 15 in it. Um, I did mention that in, the, in my August 16th letter that we were looking at, you know, trying to accommodate that number of 15 um, because some classrooms can only accommodate 15. But in looking at the way I'm building, some can accommodate much more. And we're going, like, we're not in a position to be able to hire another seven teachers, especially expecting a 20% cut in state aid um, to be able to accommodate. Nor do we have the room in the building right now. Um, what we have, what we have Building is like, like the wing, it's like a second building um, where they were all in the garden. Well, they're also going through the whole place to survive so that they can have a classroom to accommodate that space to even get the fees numbers in there. And so that, that space that of all their supplies has to be close to their classroom. So, um, in addition, we've had a real bookcase and things like that that's in part of our cafeteria at the elementary school um, so part of the cafeteria is now the storage and on the stage um we are trying to leave large classroom space open as a classroom because i look at the gymnasium as a classroom where kids can get in there for physical activity um so never in the plan in the first plan that i released in july did it ever say 15 and a half um but there were classrooms that we were looking that could only accommodate 15. I guess I'm going off of your discussions that we had and the letter that was sent out to parents about the class size around 15 or making them smaller, where we were adding teachers. So I'm just questioning why we can't go back to that. If we were able to do it in July, why not now? We weren't exactly able to in July. This was all a fluid plan. We've already added two more teachers. So we've added two teachers already into the mix. Um, we will be, as I just said, going to be adding another one. So we have added teachers, we have looked at alternative spaces, we are aiming for small class sizes, but they may not be 15. Um, I'd like to ask the other board members to weigh in if you'd like to. I think we've weighed in on this last year about this team. We but the, around, you know, said, I don't weigh in. I feel like the administration is doing the best that they can, and I'm very comfortable with the class sizes, the way that they are. I know that our, our values are have as small class sizes as possible. And so uh, there's so many parts and things, so many things that are going on, but I'm comfortable with class sizes. And I feel like I'm not trying to create it. And so this is great. But this is different. This is during a global pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, with everything in place, though. Go ahead, Mary Lynn. Would you like it? Yes. Hold on a second. Uh, I'm sorry. 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 I
I mean, I think that the class sizes are, you know, relatively small speaking. Um, we are addressing the fifth grade at this point. And there are a lot of other constraints. Um, I trust that the administration and the building level principals are doing their best um, to lay this out. And it is something that's constantly So I do feel comfortable that if we get into the second week of September and the class sizes are higher, that we'll revisit it and address it. So I'm comfortable with the plan at this point. Um, so. I, I agree, Jeff. Uh, I, I think uh, the sizes that we are looking at is, is fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's all within, and the people I've talked to in the public, when, when you talk about small test sizes, they say they think it's wrong. They, they have no objection to what we are doing. And, and if they had, want to have 20, 22 kids in a class, why not? As long as we can do it safely, and that, that's what we are planning on. Okay, I think my microphone is on now. I, I also am comfortable with the class sizes. I do feel that they are small. For the most part, they are very small compared to uh, what used to, what Barbara Wheaton is uh, referring to. Uh, my children were also in classes with 24 in kindergarten. Uh, we didn't mention also that we are doing air filtration as well. Uh, when you keep mentioning that, you know, breathing the same air, uh, that's not really within the requirements. They're going to be wearing masks. They're going to be behind these desk shields. So, um, you know, I think that there is protection in place for all the students, and I do feel that they are safe. So I have to say, yes, I am comfortable with the class sizes. Um, I'll agree. Um, I mean, as small as possible is great. We, um, we're having a difficult time getting to five days uh, a week. Um, Luckily, with some of the changes in the interpretation, we've been able to um, get our kids in the classroom so that we can get five days. Um, I, I just don't see how we can add another six, seven teachers and five, six, seven classrooms and get these classes smaller where I think they're That's sufficient. Touch the button. Um, I'm happy that the lower grades have those smaller numbers because I'm a proponent of always having that happen. Um, I think that we're in a really vicarious situation that from minute to minute we have to make decisions. I think that we just need to be a little careful as to what we put out there in the first place. And then I'm okay with the class sizes. Thank you. And I just want to make it clear, I am all in favor for a five-day full week instruction, but in the safest environment possible for the students and our staff. Thank you. So, um, you know, and, and Jen, I think you make a good point, the safest environment for our students and staff. And um, when I asked, you know, when we had to kind of pull back because of the stricter and safer guidance, um, I know parents tend to look for childcare and accommodations, and I really actually think that's important because we may have to close school or make that call at the last minute. So I'm hoping that those efforts that parents had to make within the past you know, week and a half at this point really will pay off down the road in the sense that you know we were probably one of the schools that were out there a little um, maybe very eager to open. You know, some of the ones are just doing elementary or primary. Um, some I think have expanded a little bit, maybe to the junior high, but um, you know, that the parents really have that backup plan because I would hate to have to make a call and then, you know, people are scrambling for the child care. So I just want to keep that in mind. Um, the governor could shut down the entire, like it might not be me. <laughs> You know, it could be the governor cut, shutting down the whole region, and we might be blindsided by it because we're not experiencing anything here. But he's saying Long Island is all one region. So again, uh, you know, I want to be mindful of that and, and just, you know, in, keep encouraging parents to have some backup plans. Um, so just um, one clarification, is all of Long Island one region or is it Nassau one, Suffolk another? We're told from the governor he's made statements that it's been um, just all one region, Long Island. Yeah, so Nassau and Suffolk could be very different, yet he's saying it's one region. Now, I don't know, again, just like we change, the governor could change along the way based on circumstances. 
want to say that you know I want to acknowledge that many parents um, have reached out and been extremely gracious and thankful for our plans and I, I appreciate the kind notes um, for those parents that you know still are struggling with some of the reopening and and would like some other options we'll continue to explore those other options but I want to acknowledge your letters and emails and phone calls um, I really you know I think every one of us has gotten back to every single parent within 24 hours if not sooner so I, you know I just want to thank the administrative team for really being very responsive especially when parents are so anxious and um, some of the just people need some reassurance um, I do want to also I've mentioned a couple times in these conversations just now that you know we're talking about a 20% state aid cut and we talked a little bit about that during the budget development that we heard some of that um, you know I think some people were thinking with all the money that they need to spend and the extra funds that they're spending on the COVID virus and the protection and reopening schools that perhaps the governor and we wouldn't see those cuts we're, we're not hearing that and yet people are spending more money and still going to allegedly see those um, state aid cuts particularly in September um, I'm gonna ask Mr. Bakke if he wants to chime in and I know he's been on some of the NASA, um, Suffolk County super uh, business official calls about state aid so yeah. As of right now, we should expect a 20% cut, but it's not being communicated as permanent. So it's being communicated as temporary, but it could become permanent. Um, for us, it doesn't impact right away. Like, a, like it's not really a cash flow issue because a lot of our payments. Um, on our state or aid are actually taken for our TRS. So it will impact us if it does become permanent. That'll just be less <laughs> revenue we have. Um, it's not an immediate cash flow concern. So it, we are in a good state to monitor it and see if they're actually taking the 20%. And if it does become permanent, it's something that we just have to keep in mind. We're going to have a reduction of, um, it'd be about $600,000 for the year. Frank, can you explain temporary and permanent? Temporary they'll take the 20% away from us, and then if it's just temporary, they'll give it back? Temporary, I mean, they won't, they won't give us the 20%. They'll like withhold 20% of what they usually give us. And then if they decide to not make it temporary, we'll get that money by the end of the year. If they don't, they won't give it to us. And like I said, it's not really them giving it to us because most of it is coming, um, goes to our TRS bill. So it's really that we'd have to, when our TRS bill comes due, we'd have to, there's not gonna be enough there, so then we would have to pay it at that point. So we should pr plan for a 20% cut at this time, but it's not definite. And, and Frank, the amount of that 20% would be how much? Uh, about 600,000. Thank you. Okay. I also just want to acknowledge um, Mr. Bakke's work um, over the past year, he joined us um, pretty much, I want to say about this time last year, or about, uh, maybe a month, uh, 13 months ago. Um, but I want to congratulate Mr. Baki on um, getting a new position with the North Babylon School District and wish him well in his new position. Um, congratulations on that, um, becoming the Assistant Superintendent of Business in the North Babylon School District nice and close to his home with his family. And um, so congratulations to you, Frank, and thank you for your services here. Um, really, I mean, for, for having to, you know, not a lot of transition and with the last uh, last business official, he was able to step in and really put us continue in a good financial position this year and prepare a budget for the year ahead that he won't be able to see roll out, but we will. So um, I want to thank you for that. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think you all do, Frank. Thank you. I also, uh, serving on the Finance Audit Committee, appreciate all your uh, help and answering any questions I had and uh, working with you. So thank you. Thank you. I miss everyone. Thank you. Um, so just uh, a couple of last things um, with regard to, um, you probably read in the paper today about um, the um, athletics um, restarting in Nassau and Suffolk and the differing um, information that's out there. Um, Mr. Warmoth, you want to speak a little bit and clear up some mistruths that are out there? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, so on Monday, the governor came out with his uh, reopening plan for athletics, and he suggested the number of sports that were allowed to begin um, in the fall that were traditional fall sports. He talked about volleyball and football being two sports that were not allowed to compete, but they were allowed to practice. Everything else that is traditional fall sport said they're okay to begin. On Tuesday morning, the executive boards of both Nassau and Suffolk County met independently. The Nassau County Executive Board for Athletics decided to um, cut athletics for the fall and pick athletics back up in January, on January 4th, which was a contingency plan within the state. It was one of the options that was a possibility. Nassau jumped on and they said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to wait and we're going to go in January. With that, the media got some attention to this and came out and said, Nassau and sports for the fall season to resume in January, and Suffolk County is full on board for all systems go. That wasn't the truth. Um, what had happened in the Suffolk County was within Section 11, within their executive board meeting on Tuesday morning, was that they said, we're going to pause right now. We're not going to deny and decline the opportunity to participate in, on September 21st, which is the date that we were given to open for athletics. So we're going to pause right now. We're not going to make a decision one way or the other. We're going to pause and wait for a re-entry um, guidance document from Robert Zayas, who's the executive director of athletics in New York State. We're going to wait, wait for some more information to come out from the governor's office and him to tell us, how does this happen? what should we plan for and prepare for for September 21st? So Suffolk County in section 11 did not make a decision to start or not to start. They said, we're gonna pause and wait for some more information. And that's currently where we are right now. Um, I was supposed to know by this afternoon um, from the section, but the section hasn't received their guidance document from the state department. So we're still in a holding pattern as well. And we're just waiting for information on if we so choose to open on the 21st with these sports that were recognized by the governor to, to participate, how do we do it? And then once we see the plan on how we're allowed to do it, then we, the section, can make a decision. They can always be more restrictive. Um, they can't be less restrictive than the state guidelines. But it's also... Um, Within that, it's not just the Section 11 Executive Board making this decision. There's a lot of way in from the Suffolk County Superintendents Association to say, what do you also think of this? And how do we promote this? And how do we put this forward or not? Should we take that stronghold and, and say, let's wait to January, see what happens. So the media got this and they took off with it and it kind of put us all in another bad spot. Okay, but that's where we are. Greg, could you explain to me why they would allow practice if they're not allow if they're not allowing play? I, I'm confused. I wish I could answer a lot of the questions to their decision making. Um, much of them don't make a lot of sense. Um, I will tell you that the physical education requirements are a twelve foot social distance. I can't stay twelve foot apart on the soccer field. It. it and I, I'm and I'm all for participating in athletics, but the two have to match, and they don't. Even within, you know, I think some of the guidance, like some teams can can play, you know, start to compete, while other teams could only practice. Um, I think it, it, you know, I can speak from the superintendents' association is there. There you know, are just some concerns where. You know, teams would, you know, obviously our team would be playing another district's team. And how is that, you know, affecting just some of the health and safety pieces? So I think that's, you know, that might be way in, like if Lisa, you're with your kids and not competing against another district. I know um, Mr. Warmoth is, you know, if we receive some guidance where our students could at least practice and engage in some after school activities, that we will seriously be considering that and trying to find a way to accommodate accommodate that and get students outside and playing and, and uh, obviously like in all of us in a safe and effective manner. 
and if you know, we thought that they were preparing for this and in shape for the spring season. So, so I think he has some very um, I just have one more question about the reopening plan. Um, I've been just receiving many emails about this. Um, the How many students have requested it? The remote? If there were to be a remote option, how many? Uh, I don't parents? really remember off the top of my head right now. Um, I'd have to really look at that. But, um, I, I don't know. But maybe I think we have maybe eight families at this point in time. So I don't know how many students that encompasses. I haven't checked in over the past couple of days. Okay. And when will a decision be made on whether we will be able to offer it? Right now, no. As I said, uh, rolling this out right now, we need to get school open um, for hybrid planning and full real plan. But you know, if possible, I will be doing to revisit it as much as possible. And we just, and we just, just want to say thank you, administrators, Jill. I don't know if any of you have slept since the March, and your efforts, tireless day and night, not giving up, creative, deciding this and figuring and reconfiguring. I, I, there's no words to express how much we appreciate it, and, and we know it's still a work in progress. Every day, it's going to change. But thank you for your <coughs> love for the students and for the community that you would even effort. Not, not just what we discuss. So we, you have our admiration and our gratitude. Thank you very much. Can we just give them a hand? A round of applause. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Barbara, I think that's why they're allowing these meetings to be remote, so they don't really see how bad people are. Yeah, really want to be. The camera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you again for that. Okay, let's move on to uh, Board of Ed Committees, Audit and Finance. Jeff? Do you have thank you, Barbara. Sure. So we met last week with the Audit and Finance Committee. Uh, the main topics we discussed were the external audit for 2019 2020 fiscal year. That is underway. The auditors finished up the financial statements and the audit report should be frank next month maybe early october we'll yes. probably get that yeah and then we also went through the state filings that are required once we have the financials completed we talked about the transportation contract which that's been a hot topic recently we've settled that for 1920 and we've renewed that contract for 2021 the superintendent mentioned that you know the district's working closely with the vendor to accommodate our needs this year we really have a lot of things in flux, um, so that's gonna be a work in progress like everything else. And then we talked about the tax anticipation notes. They should be issued this fall. And Frank, you spoke with the advisor, so everything's ready to go on that or will be once the new business official moves in. Yes, everything will be in place. Um, and they'll, the only thing that'll have to happen is a, a board will approve it at the next meeting. So at this September meeting, um, you just have to sign off on it, but all the um, the documents will be taken care of. Um, they're pretty much done now. They're being reviewed. Okay, great. And then lastly, the superintendent also touched on it. The business official, Frank, thank you again for your service and good luck in the new role. Um, and the board had interviews last night, and I believe we did select a candidate, and that's on the agenda for tonight. Um, so we're excited for her to get started, and she'll be ready to go, hit the ground running. And Turn it back to you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, building safety and grounds, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Barbara. Good evening. Uh, we met and went over a number of the projects for the we've been working on. It's been a busy summer for everyone. Uh, to start with the, the COVID training and our facilities cleaning, we are increasing the facility, the frequency of filter changing for the unit vents in the classrooms. We're doing deep cleaning at night, and where we can, we have a electrostatic fogging machine that we'll be using, and another one of the machines on order. Uh, our school buses are going to be deep cleaned and electrostatic fogged at, at night. 
and, and deep clean. Our air conditioning project and our door project is, is almost done, or virtually done, and it should be ready to go for the beginning of school. That's, that's, that'll be welcome. UPK will be at Country Old East. Uh, our Laurel property, we are still waiting to have the water hooked up, we're hooking up to Suffolk County water, and that's in their hands at the moment. Uh, the basketball court was was resurfaced or recoated on top in new lines. Uh, from what I've seen there, Frank, or uh, maybe we can talk to Tom. We've got some trees that have blown over on the would be the west side of the basketball court along the road. There's a series of those. I think they're arborvitae, and the, the, there's a row of arborvitae to, to shield the court from the road. And those trees probably should be top and lowered, but there's three or four of them in a row that have blown over. We'll have to be fixed. And the best, the nets on the basketball hoops need to be replaced. There's, most of them are missing. Um, the boiler at Cut Road West, we're waiting for a building permit and the roof. We're, we have a roof to fix at Cut Road East, and we're waiting on building permits for that. Uh, maybe, uh, Jill, you could talk about renting the Laurel School. We're going to have some money coming in for the, which is always wel welcome, for use of the Laurel buildings. Yeah, so, um, you know, as we spoke about just reconfiguring the classrooms, one of the things we rent space at Kachogis to just the Just Kids program. So it's a special education program for um, preschool children. Um, great partners. They're also the vendor that took over our UPK program. Um, so unfortunately, we had to move them out of the building and we moved them to the back spaces at Laurel. Um, but we have a contract with them, so we provided the same accommodations, similar accommodations that we could have provided at Cacho East. Additionally, um, it's not on the agenda tonight because we don't have a final contract, but the Peconic School is looking to rent um, for some of their classes the front half of the Laurel Building. Um, unfortunately, for the North Fork Early Learning Center, they were unable to um, get enough families to sign up and then they could not renew their lease. So I'm sad for the uh, North Fork Early Learning Center, but happy we were able to put somebody in place uh, to continue the rent at that location. Doug, I just want to share um, a couple other things. So the cleaning of the boilers district-wide are complete. These are just some health and safety kind of things that families <laughs> might um, State mandated yearly backflow testing district wide is complete. Um, we have to do a certain cleaning of the uh, kitchen and appliances, so all that was done. Um, the abatement of three elementary classrooms was done. Um, Tom will go over some of the other enhancements, but I'm just trying to stick with the ones that um, cleaning of all ductwork was done. Um, new, bottle fill, new bottle fillers and water fountains at the high school are complete. Um, so the students can still, you know, use the bottle filler piece, but you just can't use the water fountain component of it. Um, Jill, I just have a question about the bottle fillers. I meant to ask it before. Because the kids will use the bottle fillers and they'll get contaminated, like, have we thought that out? Yeah, that so, um, what you know what, we can't turn off the water. You know, so that is a regulation. So we do have a person assigned to the, what we call high touch areas, and that would be considered like a high touch area where somebody would continually come around and wipe that down. Um, we also have the HVAC filters replaced in all heating units and air handlers district wide. Um, but at the September meeting, we'll be asking Mr. Kelly to come and really do a complete overview, and you'll see some pictures of some of the projects and things that went on this summer that we thought were about. Um, Jill, I just had a question about the filters. Uh -huh. um, have the those other filters, those upgraded filters, the MERV 13, have they been considered? Yep, they were considered, and you know what, um, Frank even join, join in on this, but yes, they were considered. And um, some of our units cannot accept those filters. Um, so where applicable, they could be put in, but in most cases, our units don't accept that level of filter. What would happen is if we put them in, then in order for 
Right. Do you know where the MERV 13 would be used? Um, I don't have specifics on that, but we can share that at the September. Okay. Thank yeah, you. It would be you're exactly right, Jill, and it would be the new the new air conditionings that we put in will have the new filters because the systems are are more improved. And when we did the energy performance contract, um, a lot of the filter everything was built up to the best it could be for the system that it is. So every that's why everything's new, but not necessarily the the Right. I'm just not familiar with the layout. Which ones have the more upgraded um, systems and which not? So. Right. So it's really sure. uh, we'll, we'll be. I'll have Tom hide that in when it goes through. Thank you. Uh, and then lastly, the yearly statement and testing of our fire alarms and things like that needed to be done. Um, steam traps at the high school were cleaned, and um, the clean up tune up of the boilers district wide. So. There's lots of like health and safety things that were made a priority and then pretty much I can't believe how many other projects were able to be accomplished. Um, so again, kudos to our facilities team and you know, you can really give a big shout out when you see all the work that's been done and when the kids come back and the brighter lighting, and, you know, all the things for the staff. Uh, so is, I think we received an email um, asking um, what we were cleaning the rooms with because there was a concern with uh, some children having some reaction. So do we have any? Yeah, I asked Frank to go over the products. So the main two, the easiest way to think about it, there, there's basically two ways that they're gonna be cleaning um, because of COVID. So the first is like during school day, like when, when students are there. And the second is like at night, like the deep cleaning. Um, they're both like a 3M products that are like CDC approved products. Like they, they're, their compounds are made up of like a lot of different chemicals. So I'm not going to like go through and list them all. We can provide them for anyone who has concern about a specific element in it. Um, but the, the one that we're using during the daytime is uh, like a lighter, cleaner disinfectant that they're going to go around and spray. It dries within three minutes. Um, and it's, um, we use this like, on like like custodial come when they're doing their rounds. The one at night is when we're using the fogger that, that Doug had mentioned. So that is like an electrostatic sprayer where it's a hospital grade disinfectant, so it's stronger. Um, and what they'll do is they'll go in and spray the room. Like if you were to spray this room right now, like go walk around with the gun and spray it, it would it produces like an air spray that wraps around the entire thing. So it'll wrap and cling to like all along every surface like even underneath the table um and that way it just covers like 99 percent of the area that's sprayed so those are like so the two main points and the whole cdc approved any odor and uh the uh, evening uh dry pretty quick it, it still dries it still pretty dry quick it doesn't dry like in three minutes as, but it, it does dry quick and there is no odor thanks just one more question have we what ever used these chemicals before yes so yes. we, yeah, we, we have. have used it um it, the the fogger in the past like we've used it not on entire buildings but if there was like um complaints of say like mold or, or a smell we, there have been times where we'd clean out take the ceiling tiles down go up there and clean out and then use it for that case scenario and did people ever notice a smell or anybody get any kind of headaches or anything from it or no okay no and it can be used on wood, desks, and things like that, everything? Okay. Yeah. So, Maryland, while we, um, all the students and most of the staff were out, there were several people that were still working, and we started. So, I um, was very proactive to get that sprayer before like, all this. So, we had the sprayer very early on. So, like in Kathy and my office, you know, they would spray every night. We could tell they were there because the papers were curled a little bit. And, um, but it dries and, you know, we never noticed the smell or anything like that, and um, we know that it worked because nobody got sick. <laughs> okay. yeah, it's, almost like, think of it. it's almost like an odorless, super powerful Lysol spray that like can wrap around and cling to things. That's like kind of exactly like what it is. Okay, and are all schools pretty much using the same things? Yeah. Yeah, if they can get it. I mean, we were lucky, like Jill said, to have it. We ordered it kind of way ahead of time, um, but yeah, most schools are trying to get the exact same product. Okay. And the fogger, where will it be used? Will it be used in all over the buildings or specific areas for deep cleaning? Yeah, it's been used in like the, um, in the high touch areas and also in the classrooms. So like 
we actually use the process where we're cleaning it down with the um, the disinfectant cleaner at the end of the night. Um, the uh, facilities person will go over there, open up the bus, spray down the bus, and then by the next morning it'll be nice and clean for all the students. So it's like what we use for like the deep cleaning, so classrooms, cafeteria, buses, bathrooms. Um, I don't believe we're going to go down the hallways necessarily and do it, but um, that's where we're starting. Frank, how old is the product? Um, you know, it's a good question. I, I don't know off the top of my head. I can check for you. Um, I, don't, I don't. I don't believe it's a new product. I think the fact that people are using it in the in the fogger itself, like, and it's becoming used like, on a daily basis in schools. That process is new, but the I believe that the disinfectant itself has been around for a very long time, used in hospitals mostly. Um, but I, I'll check. And are we required uh, by the state to use anything in particular for deep cleaning? Like, are there guidelines that we have to follow? I believe the, there's not specifically that we have to use a certain product, but we follow the CDC guidelines, which is what's recommended. Okay, thank you. And so again, we, there's a list of products that are safe and approved. In some cases, um, they've actually become a little more lenient in this case, where certain alcohol-based products and things which were not previously allowed. They are allowed in the short term. We expect that guidance to change after this. Um, so some things have been lifted or become a little uh, more generous, I guess. Um, but again, as in all guidance documents, we're, these are vetted. We make sure they're allowed. Um, so, you know, we'd be, especially cleaning products, very careful about that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, negotiations and personnel. We met in executive session to discuss a, a personnel issue and legislative outreach. Uh, we reached out to the state ed department to repeal the desk to desk guidance and so and thank you for being so in touch with you know <laughs> with our legislators and and that type of thing as we walk through this um all right let's go on to personnel items may i have a motion for oh, the Barbara, before we go there is this the point where we usually ask the public if they have any comments for anything on the agenda and the only reason why i'm asking that I think somebody asked to have their email read on one of the items. So I'm going to repeat people's email, but we, I will comment on um, okay. the, the, the topic on when we get to that. Okay. okay. Thanks, George. Um, a motion I would like for the approval of personnel items A through X. So moved. Hold on a minute. Ready to what letter uh, is letter is R. Uh, no, uh-uh, no. The position's just there, just the person is extra. And if I have a question, I wait until you discuss. Okay, I'm waiting. All right, let me move. Uh, okay, now discussion. Oh. Hey, I have a question letter D of the approval of the privilege of secondary math teacher. I'm assuming is somebody talking? Um, I'm assuming that's Mr. Jarkowski's position. Was there a hiring committee for that? Was it made up of the entire math department? Um, a good portion of five math teachers, five of the seven remaining. And um, was, it, was this person recommended by the uh, hiring committee? This person was one of two people recommended. One of two people, and Christopher Bennett was recommended. You chose between the two? Uh, Mr. Um, Petretti and myself conferred, and yes, we chose this person. Okay, okay. so when you met Mr. Bennett, you, re you knew that he would be a good fit? Yes. 
<laughs> yes, based on the hiring committee making a re recommendation. So the process typically we have a committee um, make recommendations um, to uh, Mr. Petretti and myself, and then I um, interview those candidates. In this case, it's I interview those candidates and then confer with Mr. Petretti based on the findings of those conversations and review of the materials from the hiring committee, and then um, we choose the candidate. So was he the first choice of the committee? Uh, no, he was the second choice. And he stood out, why? Um, because of his repertoire of the classes that he's taught and his ability. So when we looked at candidates, um, in terms of their past experiences and the level of math, I want to say math prowess in this case. Um, the other candidate had some very low level math classes. And in this case, he's been able to um, teach calculus, pre-calculus, even at the college level. Um, he's taught um, computer science. Um, he actually has a background in computer science. That's an area that we're lacking. And so there were just a number of areas. And Julie, how did you feel comfortable that he, he met the qualifications that he said he had? You know, like sometimes when you meet people, they say, I taught calculus, I taught this, but, and you don't feel that? Did you feel that when you met him? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Did, did Dennis show uh, what you know any of, any of this, Jill? I don't think he was there. No. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a long term thing. A lot of times when a teacher retires, they want to help pick their replacement. And that's not always a great practice. It's something that we don't do. And Mr. Petretti, were you okay with this choice? Um, um, yeah. yeah. You know, he wasn't the first choice of the committee. Um, you know, with everybody, there's there's benefits and detriments to to any uh, candidate. Um, you know, it's uh, the other teacher was was a tenured in another district, and you know, had a you know had a Proven history, I would feel based on uh, the reference checks that I did. But uh, this individual has brings other things to the table um, as well. So there, there's some potential large benefits. And you um, feel that person can work with the team, the hiring committee, even though it wasn't their first choice. Uh, to see that based on the interview alone um, is uh, that that's that should be determined. I have questions for letter B, um, your approval for the health and phys ed teacher. This is for the Mrs. Berry replacement for her retirement position. Or is it? Yes, it is. And um, the now, is there a balance with female physical education teachers and male education teachers? Um, we have uh, predominantly uh, male and female teachers um, at both the high school and the elementary school, um, but we cannot hire um, somebody based on their sex. Um, so at Kutchog, are they going, is there going to be a female? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. 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 <laughs> Yes, I can. Um, at Kutchog East, will there be a female physical education teacher there? Yes, there will yes. be. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I should say that, yes, there will be right now, but we have um, some things that, that we need to look at the physical education department, but I expect that we will. Any further discussion for this next item? Item J is for Christine Springer as the social media coordinator for the 2022 year. He served in the capacity last year. Um, this was a new position created in the 1920 uh, senior um, to really um, help us get some more communication out in a timely manner. So she oversees. Um, the some of the Facebook pages, uh, also coordinating with Lisa Bieber up at the high school for social media. Um, also our newsletters and working with our PR firm and also the printer in order to get information out. Um, I think it's this 
position is critical. Um, one of the community members had written the board and just had felt that um, this what this position, um, in particularly these times, um, there's a stipend that goes with this, that's $3,000, and felt that the funds could be spent elsewhere. Um, I really feel in these times, especially, we really need to really enhance our communication. And um, I, in some districts, they have a full-time person or even a half-time person doing this. This is just a stipend and position. And I would never, never recommend eliminating this position. I think this is critical um, for all districts. And um, fortunately, with Christine's help, um, we were able to put out three newsletters this year. Um, so I really want to thank her, and I'm just glad that she's agreeable to continue in the role. I have. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. We're always stepping on each other. I know. That's okay. <laughs> step on everybody. I know. Um, uh, real quick question on Q. Um, we're we're going to be uh, appointing all these coaches. They're only going to be paid if we do start the sport programs, right? I was just going to go back to see and yeah, yeah, I have an answer on record. So, George, um, should we begin on September 21st um, with a with a schedule? We have not got from the section if we are all to go what the fall schedule actually looks like. So, if it is the standard nine to twelve week season then it would be a full salary for that or full stipend for that uh, time period. If it's a condensed season, let's say we open on September 21st and it's a shortened half season perhaps or something, they make a uh, abbreviated schedule, then we would look to prorate it possibly. And all the coaches are aware of that? Um, they will be through the MCTA. It's we're it's common practice right now. Um, we've all been talking about it around Suffolk County is how to handle that salary position for the fall, and everybody's on hold again, kind of. But the prorated seems to be unanimous throughout the county. If it's abbreviated, if it's full length, no problem. Okay, Mary Lynn. I was just going to say on C with um, Mr. Uh, Dennis Drakowski, I did want to just congratulate him on his retirement and just mention how much uh, we really appreciate all that he has done over the years. And he's always got above and beyond. He's an excellent teacher. He really will be missed. I'm sure everybody feels the same way. I just want to just mention. Thank you. Yes. I think, um, Thank you. We have a chance to read the stuff at times. Yeah. 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 Use years of service. I'm yes. sure I'm just going to ask this to study if you have a second. Do you want to say anything about that? Um, you know, it just it would be tough to put into words what Dennis has meant to this district. Um, you know, he's uh, you know, he's it, it's very funny. He, he doesn't follow traditional educational, um, you know, protocols in his classroom. He had his own way of doing it, but you can't argue with success. Um, so all the research can come in and say whatever it wants to about instruction and teaching and what you need to do. Um, but there was some magic that happened in that room and it happened forever. Um, and, you know, the students, I mean, you can just read the comments and the articles that went out. Um, time and time again, students would go off to college to study mathematics or have a tough mathematics course. And they, they talk about coming home and it, for Columbus Day weekend and finding their old notebook and bringing it back up. And it was because of that that they were able to be very successful. Um, you know, our, you know, if you look at our testing results that I give you every year, whether it be AP or um, his results are amazing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's you know, we, we laugh There's you know, you go into his room and you know where every desk is placed because there's marks. He, every day, he put those desks right back to where they were supposed to be. And, um, you know, when the shades were always, when, when I had to give teachers an example of what their classroom should look like when they came in to clean everything out and make it look, you know, uh, as, as pristine as possible um, before the start of the school year, I said, we'll just go look at Dennis's room. And he never had to come in to, to do anything. And it was 
but so without all the bells and whistles, he still created that very, very productive environment in his classroom. Um, just very even keeled, very involved in the union. Um, he was our honor society advisor forever and really raised the level of that. Um, everything he did was with such class and, and poise and uh, he is irreplaceable. Um, that's for sure. It was, that was a lot of challenges came at us this, this summer. And I know that every year for the past 13 years, his presence has been a gift um, because he could have retired a long time ago. And, uh, but he loves teaching. He loves his students and he held on, you know, and uh, I think if, if the world was a normal place right now, we, we'd have him for a couple more years. Um, you know, he decided it was his time to go and, you know, we're going to miss him. It's irreplaceable. Totally. I, I would just, I would, I would just like to echo your thoughts here. Uh, I went to school with him and, and it had a lot of year two time but it made me very proud of our town that some of our excellent teachers, Bobby Johnson was another one, uh, just, I remember going to school and it's it just, I've had a lot of pride in our, our town that so of our students and there's a number of other ones that have taught here and have been so so very very good. Absolutely. Okay. Any further discussion? Before we we have a motion and a second. And no, we have a motion yeah. and a second. This was discussion. Mm -hmm. So now we just need all in favor. Yep. Aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Motion's carried. Now on to resolution items A through W. I can put X now. Or X. Oh, wrong. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yes, it is A through X, yes. Do I have a motion for the approval of the resolution items A through X? First. A motion okay. and second. Any discussion? Yes, I have a question okay. on item V. Um, v multi-purpose room which we talked about a kitchen for home ec is that going to go forward at this point or right now um it's on hold um but uh we did a walk when we did the walk through the other day we took a look at that space um so um there's still paperwork that needs to be worked through the um architect and then to state ed so it's not a priority right now um there's lots of items in that room right now that need to be taken out, but it's still on in the works. And I may be happy to have that at the start of the year um, to space out some of my art classes as well. So I'm 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 I, have a, I have a question on S, uh, the budget transfer and the amount of uh, 61,000. What is that for? So the, that budget transfer is for uh, the prior year BOCES services. So they came in um, above budget uh, for, for those codes. So we had to do a budget transfer to pay the last bill. And service runs, is that bus runs? Um, no, it's not bus runs. It's, it's a variety of things that we use BOCES for. Um, the, the language service runs, I don't know if it uh, really means it means anything it's just both it's posting services like we get a bill for all the services we use for them and the last one in june we were sixty one thousand dollars short because the entire year we've gone over a little bit on this service or that service or something wasn't budgeted because we weren't expecting to use it so there's some contract modifications that go on throughout the year um and the end result is at the end of the year we've set sixty one thousand dollars short that we budgeted for so that's why we have to transfer it to pay the bill into a bosey's code Yeah it, could, yeah, it could it could literally be a dollar from every single one, or it could be six. It, it wasn't like sixty thousand in one account. It was just throughout the year a few different. We use a, so many different BOCI services that some are a little bit over, some are going to be under. But that's the net amount of the year. You're making projections, so it's not like you're committing to certain services. So you might use this software, but this next year you're not using that software, but you're using a different software code or something like that. So there are always projections in the BOCES items and then again when special needs students or things like that where BOCI services are needed you know those can really escalate the costs that are unanticipated. Did, um, because of the even though school 
closed, the buildings closed, but our education didn't close. But was there any savings, savings with that through proceeds? No, I don't believe there were. I think that's how we ended up behind the budget transfer. Thank you. I just had a question about uh, you, the letter of engagement with, is it ERA compliance? Is, yeah, I was curious what that is. Yeah, that, I would ask Jerry to speak on. Okay. On you, uh, ERA compliance, I'm just curious what it is, a letter of engagement. Just making sure we're compliant with websites. Oh, is that on that? No, it's on this one. It, so, what is so for E rate, it's the FEC school and libraries division, and every year we have to file for E rate. We do a 470 form and a 471 form for all of our internal connections, like light speed, light path, our fiber, some service on our switches, um, some of our firewalls. And then you get back like a 36% on that first run. And then there's a second filing we can do that's based upon our free and reduced population. And then we can put in for um, some equipment, but we have to go out to an RFP, and then we get a reimbursement the following year. Thank you. Yeah, it's federal money. And I have a question on X. Is Bruce Springer the name of the man that is going to be the mentor to the business? Yes. Okay. And my other question is W. Didn't we already approve an occupational? Um, yes, we did. And then Aaron Van Gelder always been an occupational therapist? Uh, we've had multiple uh, occupational therapists. So, so it's Aaron, has, uh, predom Aaron predominantly serves the elementary, and I think you're referring to Sue McKenna. Yeah. Uh, right. So okay. Sue McKenna predominantly um, serves, I don't want to say predominantly, mostly she serves the secondary students, and then we also have some outside organizations. So they're all consultants. So this, so this is, is just an annual contract. It's the same every year. Um, it's her contract the same every year? Is that what you're asking? Well, yes. well I get it. So I'm no, so the, OT contract, contract, so. the OT contracts, yes, we have to do OT contracts. So we don't have any internal um, occupational therapists. So yes, they're all occupational therapists have to be, their contracts have to be for hers. is a little bit different from last year. It expired in June 30th. So I think she had a three-year contract last year. So this is a year contract. Um, and we made some modifications in our agreement with her. Is there a reason why it's only a year as opposed to three? Um, I, I felt that this was best for the district um, at this point in time to really take time because we did make some adjustments to take some time to evaluate those adjustments and then be able to have the opportunity to have a dialogue with her. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, we have a motion and a second. We've had our discussion. All in favor for the resolution, I don't think it's fair. Aye. Opposed? Now, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Uh, question. Okay. Do we close the meeting and then go into the deck? I would like to go. I'd like to go back and finish some of our executive committee items. So, how do we do that? So, we have to close the meeting first and then we open the meeting. Yes. Okay. Um, second. second. Sure. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And uh, this portion of the meeting. Thank you. All right. And then do I make, I'll make a motion? I'll second. I'll second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? And so at this point, we're going into executive session. We thank the administrators for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Administrators, thank you very much yes. for your time tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Oh.